So thank you so much for being a part of this interview today. Um, I think you're such an inspiration for girls interested in a career in STEM. Uh huh. It's very nice to hear. So um, let me just start by introducing myself. So I'm Claire Shu, and I'm currently a high school junior at Boston University Academy. I was born here in Boston, but my parents emigrated from Taiwan, and I've been here my whole life. And I really enjoy my STEM classes so far, and I hope to be an entrepreneur for something related to science one day, since I enjoy running my Etsy business, selling some products I made. So um, I'm currently an intern at IEG Global Association, which is a nonprofit organization for youth education. And Paul here is the founder of IEG. This. Hey, Dr.、Um, Patia, how are you? Hi, Paul. How are you? Hi, how are you? Great. Congratulations on all the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So this IEG information interview project is meant to inspire young students and help them gain valuable insights on their career path, success stories, and this interview will be recorded and edited then uploaded onto IEG's website. Do you mind briefly introducing yourself to our viewers who might not know who you are? Sure. Hi, I'm Sangeeta Bhatia. I'm a professor at MIT. Thanks. Awesome. So let's start this interview with your childhood. What was the environment you grew up in, and how do you think this affected your career and where you are now? Sure. Yeah, I was I was born in Boston. I'm the daughter of immigrants.、Um, they, my parents came from India to the U.S. in the '60s, and、um, I think as a as a daughter of immigrants of Indian immigrants, I I felt like I had. A relatively small list of acceptable careers <laughs> that would make my parents happy,、um, like things like could I be a doctor or could I be an engineer or could I be an entrepreneur? And、um, when I was in high school, I was I had some natural affinity for kind of science and math, and so my dad kind of pointed me towards engineering,、um, and I had loved my biology class. And at the time, which was kind of the mid eighties.、Um, Bioengineering was a new field, and so my dad、um, actually brought me to a friend's lab who was working on bioengineering instruments, like making ultrasound machines for cancer, and that kind of really captured my imagination. So I decided to study biomedical engineering. Nice. Biology is also one of my favorite classes so far. And、um, what are some other opportunities you had when you were younger that you think had a Big impact on the trajectory of your life. Yeah, I think you know my parents made a lot of sacrifices、uh, to really invest in in my my sister's education. So they moved to a town that had strong public schools, and they,、um, you know, I can appreciate now that I'm a mother of of two young girls that they spent a lot of time on our extracurricular activities and investing in.、Um, Not just our academic kind of scholarship, but also who we were as people. I was a dancer growing up.、Um, I studied classical Indian dance, and my mom spent probably every Saturday for many, many years <laughs> driving me to Indian dance class. So、um, I think, you know, the the biggest gift that I had was、um, parents that were interested and really believed in in excellence and believed in my success. And、um, and a strong community. I have a great big, big Indian family. I have thirty first cousins. So、um, yeah, a lot of family around me. Oh wow, nice. And did you have any mentors or role models who were women who affected your decision? Yeah, that's a great question. So、um, you know, I would say in some ways, yes. Like I had my dad, who was super involved, and my mom was. Kind of a trailblazer herself, so she was one of the first women in India to get her MBA.、Um, but I didn't actually know any women with PhDs、um, until I got to college and I had my first summer job sophomore year.、Um, it was the first time I met a woman with a PhD,、um, and her name was Catherine Turner.、Uh, and、uh, I was working at a place called Genetics Institute, which was one of the earliest biotech companies. Uh, and actually, she was pregnant with her first child at the time, and so I like in one summer I met this woman who was she had a PhD, she was building her family,、um, and I think that sort of stuck in my head as like okay, you can you can do it, you can you could lean into this career and still have the family that you hope for. 
Awesome. And as a role man model to many young women today, how are you helping and convincing these young women to know that science is for everyone and to build their careers in STEM? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think there are a couple of different things that um, I try to do. One of them is just to try to be really visible and do interviews like this one and tell people that they can do it and it's a super fun job because um, it really, really is. Um, and then the other thing is, is to tell people to, to kind of collect, to kind of find their tribe and find each other because like kind of the best way to get through a demanding profession is to surround yourself with a support system and people who love, love what you're doing as much as you do. So, so I do that in my own life. I collect amazing women and, and I tell young girls, you know, not only to do this job because it's fun, but also to just find other girlfriends who love science and engineering like they do. Yeah. I've actually been to an event hosted by the um, MIT suite for middle schoolers like around five years ago. Yeah. Yeah, it was kind of like that. I got to meet a lot of other girls who were also very interested in maths and sciences. Yeah. So that, that Keys program, Keys to Empowering Youth, was something that I started with um, some friends in graduate school in the 90s. Um, and we started it because we thought that there's so many cool things in the labs at MIT and on most university campuses that even the most inspired science teachers like don't have access to. And so if you could invite people to campus and you could show them these labs and then they could meet undergraduate women who were just like a little bit older than them, but still kind of accessible role models. And then they could be surrounded by other young girls who had their same interests that we could like accomplish a lot of things in one day. Um, so that program has been, you know, going about 25 years now. My my girls actually have been through that program too. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And what were some challenges you faced in your school and in your career being a woman in engineering? And that's a good question. I mean, I think one one of the, my biggest challenges has been, um, you might have read about this thing called imposter syndrome. Have you heard about that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's this kind of this idea that you sort of get in your own head and you feel like a like somehow you're you're going to be found out and you're you're um, you're you're not as good as as somehow you got lucky and you got put in this situation and and you don't belong there and so I think you know I I had that little voice in my head uh, a lot of my life and actually if I think if you talk to most people they that are honest like that we all have our own insecurities and the way I've sort of dealt with it is to always be kind of over-prepared, like to always just study and, and make sure that I was prepared for the moment. And, um, and then, you know, over time, then that, that voice uh, quiets itself and you can surround yourself with people who make you feel comfortable um, and you can really contribute more when you feel most comfortable. Um, so I think it's just kind of, it's helpful to me when I recognize that other people had that feeling and it had a name, you could call it imposter syndrome, then I could, I could say like, oh, okay, this is, this is what I'm feeling. I have to figure out how to like get beyond that and, and contribute to the conversation. Nice. And similarly, what do you think are some big problems with the gender balance and how women are portrayed in STEM for careers in STEM? Yeah, I mean, I think so, you know, unfortunately there's still not enough of, uh, enough women leaders in STEM. Um, and, you know, I think if you look at, women CEOs, for example, in companies or women professors or, or really women in politics, most, most, there's not enough women leaders out there. So, you know, the bad news is where there's not enough of us. I mean, the good news is in this kind of digital moment, I think we can capture a lot of our stories and really try to amplify them. And so hopefully, you know, the kind of work that you're doing is going to contribute to that because, you don't have to wait till you're 19 to meet a woman with a PhD, right? Like you've already, you, I'm sure you met somebody before today, but today you're meeting me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And what do you think are some bad consequences if our current gender balance doesn't change? Yeah. I mean, I'm a firm believer that talent is, you know, equally distributed across the globe and across genders. And, you know, we all need to invent our way into a future you know, where there's climate change, where there's medical challenges, there's so many big problems for us to tackle as a society that we need all of the minds that we have access to, to be able to contribute. So I think, I think it's 
our obligation to get women and minorities and people from all over the world to contribute. And how do you think we as young students can work to solve these problems and try to like bridge the gender gap and get more women into STEM? So I think one of the ways is what you're doing now, which is to, to create role, role models and make them visible. Um, and then the other is to recognize that there are, there's a social science around what's called unconscious bias, um, where you know, we all have our biases and we, we bring them to work. And it's important to know about those so that you can kind of put systems in place to prevent unconscious bias. Um, so we need to make sure that when we create hiring policies that we're objective, when we set salaries, when we do promotions, when, we, when I build companies, I'm an entrepreneur, um, that I populate them with both genders. So, you know, just to be really intentional as we go through our lives in being inclusive. And kind of similarly, how are you raising your children to be aware of these gender disparities and to be part of the change that's happening? Well, you know, I think it's, it's actually a really exciting time because I think your generation is, is pretty activist. I mean, I think it's sort of, it's in the air, it's in the zeitgeist. My kids are total activists um, uh, and not just about gender, you know, about, about climate, about race. I mean, I think they at a young age are, are really interested in, in making change. And my older daughter really wants to save the ocean. Um, and my younger daughter is really interested in a more inclusive educational curriculum. Uh, and so, so they're both finding their own ways. That's awesome. And yeah, we actually still haven't gotten to your research yet. So I have <laughs> questions about that. Um, so how did you become interested in studying your tiny technology? Yeah, that, that is a, a good question. I think um, it sort of, it happened by following my nose, I'll say. Like I, I knew I was interested in the beginning in bioengineering <clears throat> and I wasn't sure what that would really mean for me for my career. So I, I started to try things out. Um, I spent every summer kind of trying a different version of bioengineering. So one summer I tried biotech where they make molecules and the, the next summer I tried um, medical devices. So we were trying to regenerate nerves. Um, and I would, I would keep trying things until I sort of found the right intersection of biology and engineering for me. Um, and that turned out to be this kind of intersection between microfabrication, which is the way we make computer chips and living cells. Um, and that was in graduate school and I got really interested with like, oh, how could these tools, these computer tools be useful in biology? Um, and my PhD project, which was working with a really inspiring mentor named Mehmet Toner, um, was around using those tools to study the liver. And once I, I learned more about the liver, I just like fell in love with the liver and I've spent my whole career on it. <laughs> so that was kind of how it happened. But I, um, I try and tell my students not to plan too much because um, you kind of have to be open to opportunity in life um, and kind of the love of science and just truly being like curious. And like, if you plan everything out today, like you, you might not be open to, you know, a brand new field, like the field of nanotechnology, which I'm now in actually didn't exist when I was a student, you know? And so, so there are probably things today that don't exist that you're going to be able to do. So you kind of have to be open to them. Mm -hmm. And what made you end up choosing the liver and working on it for so long? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's one of these organs where there's really no medical treatments other than transplant. <clears throat> so, you know, if I contrast it with, for example, heart disease, so heart is a super important organ. We have medicines for the heart, for like for blood pressure. We have stents, which are these tubes that keep your blood vessels open in your heart. We have bypass surgery where we like put a vein in the heart to go around the black blood vessels. We have artificial hearts. We have what are called left ventricular assist devices, a whole bunch of things for heart disease, right? And so that's great. Those are great options for those patients, but in liver, there's really just a transplant. 
all you can do is go on the transplant list. There's no medicines, there's no devices. And so what that means as an inventor is that at anything that you do has like a huge potential impact. Um, and so that coupled with the fact that it's just like this really cool organ that does 500 things, it's an amazing factory, um, kept me working on it for so long. Nice. And that's why your research is so amazing because yeah. there really aren't any other solutions. And what was your biggest motivator for your research and your success? I mean, I think it's changed in time. You know, when I was a graduate student, I, I really wanted to do your, your job as a graduate student when you get your PhD, which is after college, um, is to do what's called original research. So you're supposed to do something that no one ever did in the world, <laughs> you know, which is really hard. Um, and so my goal at the time was to like get my project working. It took me like three years to get it working. And I was trying to pattern cells on a surface with these computer chip technologies. And I wasn't really thinking yet about how it could be useful for patients because I was kind of just looking at what was right in front of me. Um, and then later on when I would become a professor, I would start thinking about like, okay, how could this invention be helpful? How could we use this for inventing better drugs or how could we implant these cells and help patients? So I think at every step of your career, like your goals will kind of evolve. Speaking of goals in your job, what's the best part about your job? Oh, the best part of my job is, is my team, the people that I'm training that I work with. So science is kind of an apprenticeship. You know, I have a lab full of students that are undergraduates and graduate students and postdocs and working with them is, is the best. Um, on Friday, I only work with my lab. So I don't do teaching. I don't do startups. I, I don't consult. I just spend the day with my lab and I call it Science Fridays. So you're catching me at the end of my Science Friday. Um, it's the best day. Nice. And I think that just about concludes the interview. So thank you so much. I think the young women watching this will really take your words to heart and be inspired to pursue their dreams. Yeah. Well, it's been great to meet you. You did a great job. <laughs>